Live from the San Jose McHenry Convention Center, it's The Cube at Open Compute Project U.S. Summit 2015. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are here live in Silicon Valley for the Open Compute Project Summit 2015 or OCP Summit 2015. That's the hashtag, join the conversation. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. Where we go out to the events, we strike the sins from the noise. SiliconANGLE Media Production, which includes SiliconANGLE, Wikibon, and theCUBE, all under one umbrella, bringing all the signal to you here, all live in Silicon Valley where all the action is. This is where the innovation is. I'm with Jeff Frick, my co-host, our next guest, the James Liao, founder and CEO of PK8. Welcome to theCUBE. Thank you, nice um, to meet you guys. We were talking on our intro, this is where the action is right now. All the smart money's here, you can see all the smart VCs that I know, the best in the business are out here. Right. There's, there's real technical innovation going on, but a shift and an inflection point happening at the same time. You have software-defined infrastructure, right? right. Everything software-defined, and you have embedded concepts, systems on a chip, intelligent software, adaptive like fabric. These are decade-old concepts now right. brought forward with open source. So, this is greatness. Now, everyone always says, oh, that's great, but the network's still the bottleneck. Right, so, exactly. Tell us, what the hell's going on with the network? Is it going to get faster? Virtualization, SDNs on, on the horizon. Give us the update. Where's the innovation at the network level? So, so basically, I think that networking is going through a big paradigm shift. Uh, in, in the past 20 years, we have seen the, a, a lot of changes in the computing, in the storage part. Uh, the, the hardware is commoditized, standardized, and then people bring the software, and then eventually software bring the virtualization. So there, there are a lot of changes, and now rolling clock forward, uh, 20 years later, now with the technology we have in the data center, you can uh, create a virtual machine within 30 seconds. You can attach one terabyte of storage for 30, uh, within 30 seconds. But once you are done with the virtual machine and the virtual storage, how do you deploy that? If you want to deploy the, the virtual machine into your data center, you have to go through networking. And all the networking right now is manually managed, which means you have to create your firewall policy, your security policy, your load balancer policy, all your routes, how does traffic go into this machine, how does traffic go out of the machine. So the change uh, itself, by deploying the, the virtual machine, which takes 60 seconds to create, now it takes one day to configure. That's how things slow down. So in order to solve that problem, we just have to think about what we have done with computing and storage. The technology we bring to, to storage and, and computing is standardizing the hardware, bringing more software, creating more application, creating more innovation to the software, so that we can create a virtualization of the, the networking. So I noticed you guys did a crowd chat with Scott Rainovich, one of our friends of theCUBE, also a guest uh, co-host, Scott, if you're watching. Right. Uh, I hope the slopes are okay, 65 <laughs> degrees you set up in, <laughs> up in Bozeman, Montana. A good friend, but he had a very interesting conversation. One of the sure. top voted questions was, who's involved in this white box food chain? And what does PKA do? And hashtag SDN, uh, NFV. Right. NFV implying service provider. A lot, of, a lot of stakes on the table right now in terms of you know, high stakes poker. Exactly. What's going on? What's the white box mean and, and what's the big prize? What are people fighting for? So I think, I think the networking is good. The, the paradigm shift in the networking industry bring a lot of opportunity to, the, uh, to all vendors. There are a lot of segregation in the, in the supply chain. So people start to realize, I can separate the hardware from the software. People start to realize that I can separate control plane from the data plane. Uh, I can separate the physical network from the virtual network, right? So by doing different segregation, you, you start to bring in more vendors into the game. And on the white box side, for example, if we talk about white box, now there are a lot of vendors from Asia, from Europe, from US, that can create a white box, uh, which is very efficient, very high performance, very low cost easy yeah. to manage, easy to program, right? So people like, uh, vendors like HP, Dell, has already joined the game, right? Even, uh, even Juniper is, is announcing that they want to be part of the game. And besides that, from Asia Pacific, you can see a lot of vendors like Quanta, like uh, uh, Wistron, like uh, uh, Celestica, uh, and Alpha. This kind of networking vendors used to be doing a lot of manufacturing for big name brain, 
yeah. they are now realizing, hey, this is the opportunity, we can come out to start doing the game. So on the supply chain side, on the hardware side, I think it's very open and we see a lot of vendors join the party. On the software side, we're seeing a lot of changes on the software side too. Uh, operating system side, you got Pika 8 in the game, you got uh, Cumulus also, also creating a lot of innovation, but most importantly, on top of that, we see tons of vendors, dozens of vendors trying to create new innovation to change the, the efficiency of the network. So disaggregation is interesting here, right? So you're mm -hmm. basically isolation allows for efficiencies and take costs on manufacturing. Exactly. And then the innovation can come in at any, at any vector, right. software or other hardware components. Exactly. Okay, so let's step back a second. So for the, the average enterprise out there who's got some money to spend, right. you know, <laughs> they have challenges. What's the core problem that you guys are solving? Is it the scale out, scale up combination? The scale out's been a great thing, but they're used to scaling up with the right. old school you know, vendors, which lock a little more general purpose. Exactly. Can they get both best of both worlds, and how do you guys help the network solve this problem? I, absolutely. I, I think the, the real thing people try to solve is that in the past 25 years, networking is basically just one solution. Cisco defines the architecture, everybody follow the architecture, you can replace a couple of top of rack, but you still follow the same architecture. And what we're hearing from our customer is that, hey, I, I'm not running the same application as other people. I have my unique need. Some of the people are running host service, so they, they got a lot of tendency inside the network. Some of the customers, they run mega data centers, they have to scale out. Right, and some of the customers, they have only a few departments inside, the, uh, inside their, their uh, organization, but they got a lot of security policy they have to apply. And some of the customers are telling us that networking is very important to their, uh, to their infrastructure, so they want to make sure it's a zero downtown. And in the past, you only have one recipe. Cisco tell you, I put this big core in the, in the network, and then you do active passive. Right, yeah. and everybody do the same way. However, if you look at the application, everyone is using different application. So it doesn't make sense to follow the same recipe. Mm. So do we want to do scale out or do we want to do scale up? That's actually not the, the very core of the question. The question now is that if I have my need of solving certain things, do I get the tool? Do, can I have the, the freedom to use the tool to solve the problems? This is very similar to the mainframe to PC change. In the very beginning of the change, mainframe has much more computing power than PC. But mainframe doesn't have any flexibility. You want to use IBM mainframe, you go to IBM, ask them to create an application to solve your problem. You want to- uh, well, IBM uh, System Z has Linux support now. Uh, you exactly. could argue that for the big banks, they can get best of both worlds. Exactly. In a, in a single threaded environment. Exactly. Not necessarily multi-threading. But 20 years ago, yeah. it was a big change when people started to realize PC is much more flexible. Yeah, yeah. I can write my own application on top. That's a big change. I think we are going through exactly the same change right now. Uh, the networking users start to realize my need is different from everybody else. Let's break that else. down, I want to get your perspective, because you brought sure. up a good point, the mainframe kind of triggered me a little bit, because right. we're covering the Z thing, which we like the IBM new Z stuff, right. but it's different, it's not your old grandfather's mainframe. Correct. And it's also single thread, and their, their <laughs> workload's very specific. Mm -hmm. You mentioned workloads, this, uh, this isolation and disaggregation is interesting, because now you can actually have flexibility in workloads. Mm -hmm. Talk about that dynamic, because whether it's NFV for service providers, or something else, workload diversity it's a big issue, right? Exactly. So isn't that the fundamental issue right now, workloads? It's a, it's a very important issue. So if you look at the workload, a, a lot of people, they run different applications generating a lot of wor different workloads. So for example, if I take uh, banks as an example, in the daytime you're doing a lot of trading. Your workloads are a lot of small packets running inside yeah. the network. Latency is the most important thing. Yeah. <laughs> but in the nighttime, you have to back up your database. You're trading database the whole day, you have to back it up. Now, it, every And by the way, if you big. miss your window for opening trade, the million, hundreds of millions of dollars are at risk. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and if you have uh, some application. Minutes or, minutes or years in, in savings, right? Exactly, I mean, and if you have a application, for example, backup application, they just screw up and start sending traffic in the tra uh, trading time, you probably lose millions in minutes. Hundreds of millions. Right, exactly. That's the, that's the consequence. So, so these are the things that you have to figure out my networking has to support my, my application. So in terms of workload, when I look at the workload, most of the people only see computing, they only see storage. 
they don't really know how networking is, is working inside this whole networking thing. So if you have a workload, specific workload, and you can analyze to the level, so here's the important thing. Not only you have to provision your workload on your networking, you have to know how these uh, workload is performing inside your network. So you, you got to have a cycle to say, I can provision it and I can create, uh, I can collect the data. So you need the monitoring and you don't want to compromise latency because that's exactly. another one benchmark. Exactly. So it's, a, it's an interesting dilemma, right? Right, and you don't want to create m more workload for human, right? <laughs> that's right. another thing. You, you don't want to say, every time I program a network, I have to add a couple of uh, network engineer to program a network. So what is the best way to handle this? Whatever we have done in the past 20 years to virtualize the computing and storage, whatever lesson we have done to reduce the capex and opex, those are the things that we can now consider how to do it in the networking side. So how do customers do it? Obviously they can't just turn off the old system and flick on the new, and we do a lot of big data shows and we talk a lot right. about you know, the journey, right? How, right. Do you, how do you get there? Where do you start? How do you find some early wins? And, and some success. So within your customers, how are people slowly migrating over to a more software-defined That's a network? great question. We get that question a lot. When people talk about SDN, the first impression they get is that, well, SDN is going to completely change my network. So I got my current network running. I cannot afford to bring down my network and create a new one. Right, right. So there is no possibility I can migrate to SDN. Uh, the fact is that there is an easy way to migrate to SDN. Uh, the first thing you want to consider is that throughout, I, I just mentioned that there are a lot of disaggregation between the, the different layers, right? Hardware versus software, control plane versus data plane, uh, virtual network versus uh, physical network. So most of our customers start to realize one thing. Uh, the first step they can easily take is to bring in Ybox. You bring Ybox, putting a different software on top, now you got the freedom that you can run different software. However, bringing in Ybox itself has a lot of challenges as well. So you need some software company like PKA to help you to migrate to, to Ybox. So our first step to our cu customers is always trying to make Ybox easy to use. And is that a carve out based on a workload? Is it a carve out based on the data center? I mean, again, you know, getting started when you've got something up and running, it's got to be It's just tricky. easy replacement okay. because you basically bring in Ybox, but all the operation model stays the same. Okay. Then the next stage is to look at in, into, that's where your workload start to, to work. Now you have a Ybox in your network. You start to look into the workload of your network and then determine do you want to use scale up a solution or do you want to use a scale out architecture. A lot of our customers are migrating from scale up to scale out uh, architecture because it's easier for them to expand and it doesn't have the physical limitation. So that's the second step. The third step is that as soon as you determine your architecture, you will start to realize you have to manage the network. It, now it's becoming more, uh, more complicated. So you have to figure out a way to automate the, the configuration. And these are the things that we help our customer by bringing in Linux as our platform uh, into our platform, people can bring the tools to program the, the, the platform. And then the fourth step is that once you have this architecture management tool, Ybox in the place, you can start to bring in the new software or new SDN technology to work with your system. With that, we have a cross flow, we have a certain technology that can blend the SDN open flow architecture with the current architecture. So we basically help us, uh, our customers to go through four steps. First step, Ybox. Second step, uh, architecture change. The third step, automate all the configuration. And the fourth step, to, to reach the SDN technology. And how long does that take generally, or some examples? Depends on different customers. Some of the customers can go from one to four within one, uh, one year. Okay. That's really quickly. But some of the customers are more conservative. They want to make sure they have every step proven, every step is no downtime at all. So some of them may take even 18 months, two years to carry out the whole transition. So it really depends on customers and depends on the, the, the size of right. the network. Some of the other customers basically just bring up the SDN into their work, network. They got a, a sizable network, but they, they determined to go to SDN. Within six months, the, everything is running. So it really depends on how you want to migrate your platform all the way. And, and the key issue people try to solve is not CapEx. I think CapEx is the important issue they want to solve in day one. 
but the real issue they want to solve is OPEX. The network is becoming more and more important and more and more complicated. If you don't bring in the new technology software to manage the network, you have to continue to hire a lot of people to manage a small size of network. And when you try to scale out or scale up, to scale your data center or scale your network, you run into problem of human. Can there be multiple OS's in the data center? And how big is the market for white box OS's? I, I think there definitely can be multiple OS for data center. Depends on how you want to use your system. It's just like everybody is believing that uh, Microsoft is dead, right? Red Hat or <laughs> Linux is taking over the world. But if you look at uh, Microsoft, they still have a, a, a big chunk of the market. So definitely and they're using that in the cloud game too with Azure. Exactly. You're seeing what Windows and SQL on Windows. Exactly. <laughs> so I, I think yeah. that there's definitely a room for multiple OS vendors in the uh, in the networking sector. Uh, how big is the white box market? I think. Most of the big data centers, especially people uh, that come to OCP, you can talk to them, you will start to realize people start to use uh, Ybox in the, in the data centers already. Even though it's not really well known, not a lot of people come out to talk about it, but Ybox is penetrating the market. Cisco's revenue is 30 million, right? So just think about Ybox. If Ybox grow to 10% within a couple years, that's the three million by itself. That, that three billion by itself, that's a huge market. And by, more, more, by bringing more and more people to come to the market and can customize their platform or customize their solution, you've got more and more networking functions migrate over to, to Ybox. So my gut feeling right now is that even though not a lot of people coming out to say we completely changed the, uh, the network, there are a lot, of, uh, a lot of vendors or a lot of customers are testing Ybox already. Another proof is that even small companies like PKA, we have more than 350 customers worldwide. So a lot of people are using Whitebox in their production line, a lot of people are using Whitebox in their test lab already. So talk about your business, okay? Where you guys are, the founding, the story, and what are you guys doing solving your customer problems, and what are those problems? Right. And where do you guys win, and where, do you, where are you guys improving? Right. So, uh, PKI started in 2009. That was long before the Whitebox idea. The open up. flow kind of market? It was, uh, like, it was started with the open flow uh, as a penetration point, but in the very beginning, our vision was very simple. It, 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 it came along with my, my background. I worked in tandem for about 10 years. And before, uh, before I come out to, to startup, I, I was going through the whole change of mainframe to PC. So I was on the mainframe side watching everything from now. <laughs> and that was an interesting experience. Fault tolerance, all those systems, banking, trading. Exactly, we own about 98% of the, the banking market. So at that time we said, there's no way. So high availability people. was your DNA. <laughs> exactly. Fault tolerance. Total innovator. Yeah. Exactly. Right. And we tell people, hey, if you need a, a huge telecom system, you need tandem database, right? You need a, a banking system, you need tandem database. You, everything is a tandem database. So we look at things through our lens, everything is a database application. What we didn't realize is that when you go to PC, you don't need data, database at all. People try to solve different problems. So in 2009, before I started this company, we are looking at the market, I got a feeling this is happening again to, the, to networking. Actually in 2000, the same thing happened to storage. NetApp and EMC came up, right? And the, in 2006, 2007, Android is starting to, to come out and people start to realize, whoa, there's a, yet another operating system. And at that time, I started to watch what chip company, what ASIC company is doing, and start to realize that ASIC from the off-the-shelf commercial silicon is catching up with the, the big companies like Cisco's internal chips. So, if that happens, good enough then, becomes good enough, right? Exactly, <laughs> and then you are going to start to see the whole market is going to migrate over to these white box vendors. And we saw that coming in 2009, we started saying that, what do people need when white box is coming? An easy answer is that, well, we create a software to do layer two, layer three. But that doesn't solve the problem because every box is yeah. small, you are going to end up uh, managing a lot, of, a lot of boxes on the, so let's take a step center. back, because one of the things we watch at Silicon uh, Angle and theCUBE and Wikibon is networking. You know, Stu Miniman's Correct. all over it, Dave Vellante, David Floyer. You know, we're totally mm -hmm. watching the landscape. Right. It's not just at the lower level open compute, at the cloud game, it's 
the battleground is in the network layer. Mm -hmm. You look at what VMware, Google. Exactly. Uh, you can just read the tea leaves, it's pretty obvious. Even that's where the battle. Stack. OpenStack, that's right. where the battleground is. Right. Pass layer, there'll be multiple middleware layers. Okay, buy that. A little Cloud Foundry over here, over there, right. whatever. No problem. Network layer. Why is the battleground so hot in network? And what are the innovations that have come out of SDN? Right. Just going back since Nasir was bought by VMware. So, if you look into IT infrastructure, there are basically three components. Computing, storage, and networking. Right? Computing and storage have been virtualized, and, and these cloud, that enables the cloud. However, in the past, people basically just covered their eyes and said, hey, networking, as long as we yeah. have enough bandwidth, let's just keep it at the corner and say, we don't care. We, let's figure out how to solve everything with the software. But as you grow your data center, you start to realize networking is going to be your limit. Uh, in fact, there are a lot of talk about uh, barriers, right? The scalability barrier, the flexibility barrier, deployment barrier, it's all about networking. So people start to realize, hey, we solve a lot of problem on the storage and, and computing side, but because of networking, we cannot deploy anything. So now, the, all the attention is on the networking. And this is 25 years problem. This is not just yesterday's problem. Right, so right. it takes time to solve the problem. And it takes time to bring new vendors to the market, bring new supply What's chain What's the bottleneck? Is it the technology? Is it hurting the cats on the vendors? Is it standards bodies? Is it I think the, the, the real bottleneck is the usage model. People have this mindset that, hey, networking is something I shouldn't touch, right? So if I want to touch the network, bring <laughs> the Cisco guys that sitting by me before I make, make the change. So that's because the Because of disruptive thing. operations. Exactly. There's an impact. Right, reliability is always the key of the networking. However, the complexity and all the slowness to, to deploy things is really eating customers right now. So, so I think the, the most important thing now is that to start to realize networking is something that you have to change. And that my, mindset is the, the biggest barrier. Once customer get over that mindset, we got a lot of tools out there. We got Whitebox, we got OpenFlow, we got SDN, we got programmability, DevOps. All these things can help people to migrate to new networking. So but if you, if you. What's the pain point on that? Is it heavy duty migration? What gives a taste of like, I'm a customer like, hey, you know what? I, I got DevOps in my future, I got, I'm hiring a lot of app developers, I, want, I got containers being deployed, right. I want a programmable infrastructure, and I want a data center operating system. Come on, what do you got? Right. What so, do you say? So the pain point is, is not really the technology by itself. The pain point is the business model. So people try to solve the pain point that, uh, for example, I'm, I'm running a container right now. Cisco is telling me to do it this way. Now I need to add another container. What do I do? I have to hire another guy. So you have to deal with those problems, and by dealing with those problems, you need to figure out an open way to program your network. You need the tools to bring the hardware, you bring the tools to bring the new application. So these are the pain points that people have to deal with. So, so you said that people you know, just <coughs> didn't want to touch the network. That was, you know, don't break it, it's fine, just add right. more bandwidth. Once they've made the lead to SDN, and they, and they see the value, mm -hmm. Do they, do, are you finding customers <coughs> really see the value, not beyond just going, get, getting away from the barrier, but really opening up new opportunities to do things that they could have never Absolutely. done before? Absolutely. And I wonder if you can share any, <coughs> any good uh, stories with so that. So we have a customer that uh, yeah, runs three data centers. Okay, inside the data center, every time they create a new data center, <coughs> they have to deal with a couple problems. The, you have to put the infrastructure in place, you have to provision your network, you have to bring network engineer. And because the, the data centers are spreading over the U.S., you now have to set up the team in U.S. over the global team. And they set up the policy before they develop their SDN solution. They set up the policy. I want a zero touch ne uh, network. Because for server, for storage, I can do ne zero touch, uh, mm. no problem. But networking, I always have to have somebody on site to program the network, to watch the network. So, <coughs> they set up this policy that they want to do zero touch provisioning, zero touch, uh, zero touch fault tolerance, that kind of things. And you need a software to do that. So once they, uh, thank you. Once they solve that problem, uh, they now are running three data centers. They are looking into the next three data center they want to start. Guess what? In the past, it takes six months to bring out three data centers. Now it takes days. Okay. Yeah. And that's the problem, that's the solution. Once you get through that, th from three to six, six to 12, 
you just don't have any barrier. You just continue right, to roll out right. your data center. That's great. So the question about um, the market is one final question for you. What do you guys <laughs> want to do? What's your objective this year? I see you guys have been out there. SDN is super hot. Right. Internet of Things is exploding as an application, right. which essentially means mobile computing and every other connected IP device. Exactly. What's the future for you guys? We want to change the network industry. So that's, that's our mission. Our mission is to change the network industry from a closed environment to an open environment. We cannot solve all the problems, so we have to build up a lot of, a lot of partnership with our, uh, with our partners to solve the hardware supply chain problem, to solve the chipset problem, to solve the application problem. But essentially what we're trying to do is that we see software-defined data center as the end game. You want everything to be virtualized so that today if I'm running a virtual machine in the US, tomorrow I can run it in Australia. And the day after, if I'm traveling to Japan, they can follow me to Japan, right? So this is the vision. The vision is that we want to, we want to enable software-defined data center. And in order to solve that problem, you have to solve the networking problem. In order to solve the networking problem, PKA has to be the one, or at least one of the vendors, to enable the change. Right now, if you don't have a way to segregate the hardware from the software, virtualized data center to physical data center, or the control plane from the data plane, you cannot get this to happen. So what we try to do is to focus on how to disaggregate those areas and enable other vendors or other partners to solve the problems. James Leo, thanks for coming on theCUBE. And remember, when you're a billion dollar company, don't forget us, okay? Because, <laughs> you know, so. you were once on theCUBE. <laughs> we're doing our part, going out to the stories. Are, Thank you, you so much. a great opportunity. You guys are in probably one of the most important areas in the technology this industry is right now. There's right. unicorns in this room. Right. You guys could be one of them. You got a great product, great that. team and it's hot area, so best right. solution will win. Right. It's not market, you exactly. can't market, market your way to this, in this market. We're lucky. Right. Congratulations. <laughs> this Thank is theCUBE, live in Silicon Valley. We'll be right back with our next guest after this short break. Open Compute Project Summit here in Silicon Valley. This is theCUBE. I'm John Furrier with Jeff Frick. We'll be right back. <laughs>